Well, good morning. My name is Alex Fernandez. I'm one of the pastors here at Cornerstone. I'm the pastor here at the Heritage Hill campus. Whether you are joining us online or you're here present today, it's an honor to be in worship here this morning. I'm going to do something real quick. I'm going to throw up our check-in QR code. And uh, I would just encourage you, once a month, uh, there's QR codes, I think, in the seat backs in front of you, or we put it up on the screen for those of you online. Once a month, check in. If you haven't in a while, do that. Uh, It helps us understand who's here, uh, but not from an attendance standpoint. Uh, But just this is how you get in our database. And when you check in, there's actually a box at the bottom that you can opt into the newsletter at Cornerstone. So if you haven't ever received the newsletter, we don't push it out to you. It's something you can opt into. You can stay in the know about the things that are happening. Uh, If you've never checked in before, you're brand new. There's actually cards in front of you, uh, in the seat backs in front of you. Uh, Fill that out. Bring it down to our guest services desk, and we have a gift for you just for stopping in. Um, the other reason I tell you that is because every once in a while I do push out an email to the Heritage Hill database and uh, we have lots of things going on this summer. Uh, I have some cookouts planned, some fun community stuff that we're going to be doing and so to be in the know there, uh, it helps that you check in so that you're in our database so I can push that out to you. Uh, fun stuff like food trucks and other things that we're planning. Uh, so I encourage you to do that. Um, also today, we're going to end with a time of communion, as you might see up here. Uh, if you're at home, I give you that heads up so that if you have to grab some elements, you, I would love for you to participate with us this morning in that. If you have no idea what communion is, I'll explain it at the end, and I'm, I'm going to invite everybody here to participate if it's in your spirit to do so. <sighs> here we go. Got it all up. Uh, in 2006... I remember 2006. In 2006, Barna Research uh, paired up with Pew Research and did one of the biggest studies they've ever done. Uh, That study uh, reached out to and found more than 10,000 non-Christians and asked them to participate in the study. And the study was this. They gave them a list of characteristics Uh, not of Christians, but just characteristics of people and said, identify the words on this list, good and bad, that you connect in your view of Christians. You want to know what they said? Over 10,000 people studied. The top word that was, I don't even know if this is, is this one through three or is it three three through one? I don't want to blow it. Uh, Number one was judgmental. Number two, hypocrite. Number three, too political. This was back in 2006. This was back in 2006. Right? And while words like kind and friendly made the top 12, I don't know why the research says top 12. I can only assume that one of them made it ahead of that and then one of them was number 12. But of the top 12 things that people associated with Christians, most of them were negative. In 2017, they repeated that study. And in 2017, the same top two answers were on the list, judgmental and hypocrite. But in 2017, the word hateful and anti-gay made it into the top 10. A third of the people in the polls said that Christianity is old-fashioned and out of touch with reality. It's kind of a sad study. I mean, who are they describing? When I look at that list, I look at that list and I, I think, I don't think that describes me. When I think about the Christians that I know, I don't think it describes the Christians that I know. I mean, we all probably have somebody in our family, maybe it's an uncle who, who we associate with those words or, or we see things on our screens of people who say they're Christians and, and, we, and, and maybe that's where the perception comes from. Um, but who are they describing in this? I, I can think of some people that give Christianity a bad name. But is that who Christians are? The reality is that 
that is the perception of all Christians. Sad. Now, now the two, there's two important words in that um, study that I want to pull out. And the first one is the word hypocrite. Now, in our present day, the word hypocrite, we associate a hypocrite is somebody who says one thing and does another, right? Somebody who's real preachy about something. Uh, no, it doesn't have to be religion, but the, somebody who says one thing and, and acts a completely different way. Uh, but we talked about this word a few weeks ago in, in, as part of the Sermon on the Mount. What Jesus described as a hypocrite is a hypocrite is somebody who does the right thing for, a wrong, for the wrong reason. It's a different definition in, than in our day. See, a hypocrite back then is somebody who does the right thing for the wrong reason. He was often calling out the religious leaders of that day and he was calling them hypocrites. Because although they, they prayed and they fasted and they, they checked all the boxes of what a good religious person would do, their heart was not in the right place. And so Jesus, says, Jesus was calling out their hypocrisy. You see, you're doing the right thing, but you're doing it for the wrong reason. Maybe it's to elevate yourself. Maybe it's to, for people to, to, to honor you and not God. That's, that's what a hypocrite was. Now, judgmental is a much harsher word. See, a, a judgmental is somebody who makes a moral decision about somebody's character or behavior. You know, judgmentalism is about right or wrong, guilt or innocent, good or bad. That's different than opinion. I, I, you know, the question might be, well, can I, can't I ever form an opinion about somebody? And you might have a bad experience with somebody over and over again, and you might deem that because they continue to let them down that they're untrustworthy. Is that valid? Or, or on the contrary, somebody who you know you can count on no matter what, that person's trustworthy. Those are opinions that we have about people. They're different. Opinion and judgment are different. Let me give you an example. Everyone should vote like me. That's an opinion. You're a bad person if you don't vote like me. That's judgment. You see the difference? See, I, I can have an opinion about something, but I also can be judgmental with my opinion. Uh, judgmental, let me, let, me, let me try to do what Jesus did uh, with, the, with that word. Because judgmental has a definition in our time. Let me, let me try to do what Jesus did with this word and give you a different definition for us to ponder here today. Judgmental is somebody who does the right thing pointed in the wrong direction. Let me tell you what I mean. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was working at our 84th Street campus and I was coming downtown and it was back when there was all the construction on 131. Everybody remember that nightmare? Right? Uh, you couldn't get up 131 North, and then, you, and then it was later 131 So I had to make my way downtown through a lot of back roads, and everywhere I turned, there was more construction. Who are these people that were planning all the, this? Is the, the, so dumb. That's judgmentalism. Did you see what I'm doing there? It was, it was just, I was trying to weave my way to get to Heritage Hill. And every turn that I found, there was more construction. And I ended up coming up the back roads, and there's a Planned Parenthood not, long, not far from here. Uh, I think it's on Cherry and Morris or somewhere over there. And I came to the corner, and there was some traffic going by. And I noticed the guy standing in front of the Planned Parenthood location, and he had a sign. Some of you are nodding. Maybe you've seen people there before. Some, I didn't get to read the whole sign, something about the unborn or whatever. And, and as, as I sat there and I waited for traffic to go by, I imagined what that person might have written on their sign. And, and I imagined what that person might have said to somebody who came there that morning and maybe stopped into that location. Maybe not even knowing what they came for. What did that person say to that person? What did that person say to people who were exiting that building that morning? What, what did that person say to people who came to work that morning? What did he say when they left? I was processing all of this as I was sitting there, and, I, and, and that's the kind of stuff that irritates me. 
That's, I mean, if you want to know what are my pet peeves, it's that kind of stuff. That's the stuff that irks me. As justified as a person might feel in their conviction, it doesn't come across as anything but hateful in that moment. It's, it's that kind of person that gives Christianity a bad name. It's that kind of person that floods surveys with those kind of answers. You feel what I'm saying? And as I turned down that street and I was driving up closer to the building, it dawned on me. I just totally judged that person. <laughs> I did. I wonder what I would have said had I gone up to him and had the time to stop and have a conversation. I might have said, you know, what are you doing out here? Why are you being like that? What's wrong with you? I totally had labeled him a bad person. You know, sometimes God gives you messages to write. That you're talking to yourself. And as I was working on this message over the last few weeks, I, I started to think about that survey. And I, and I thought, you know what? Christians are way more judgmental of other Christians than non-Christians. We judge Christians like nobody else. We judge people's theology. We judge people's doctrines. We judge other Christians' sermons. We judge people's way of worship. We judge people's social stances. We judge a lot. And if we willingly do that to Christians, how much more are we willing to do it to non-Christians? And Jesus knows this about his followers. Jesus is crystal clear about his followers on this. And as we turn the pages, now we're in the Sermon on the Mount. We're moving to chapter 7. This is a big chapter, guys. As we move into chapter 7, Jesus is going to pivot. And at the beginning of chapter 7, he is going to talk to his followers. Not individually but as to his followers, and he's going to paint the picture of what it looks like to be a community of disciples together. And in this part of the message, he's going to make us do some hard self-examination. In the verses that we're going to look at today, he's going to use some of the harshest language he's used to this point so that we become the kind of people that Christians and non-Christians want to be in community together with. Are you ready? Here's how Jesus begins. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, he says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. I don't think I have to explain to you what a judge is. I think most of us know that as a noun, a judge is a person who studies the law. A judge is, is somebody who has the authority uh, and also the qualifications of hearing and determining cases in a court of law. Uh, sometimes a judge is a person who is in a, uh, in a seat in a competition or a contest and, and they're giving their judgment or their opinion about somebody and their, their qualifications or their performance. See, a judge as a noun is somebody who's qualified to give an opinion. In this verse, judge is a verb. In the Greek, it means to decide. And if you're not qualified, it comes with a negative tone. I also want to point out that as this verse begins... Uh, Jesus doesn't tell us that we can't judge. Is it up there? Put it back up there. I'm not so sure it's a command. I mean, I think it's sinful to judge. But this one's interesting because Jesus puts an or in this one. I mean, look, look in the scriptures. Try to find me another command of Jesus that Jesus says, don't do this or. 
It sounds like there's a, there's a choice in this one. He's not saying we can't judge. He's putting an asterisk on this one. It's a warning. What's he warning us about? Verse 2. He says, for in the same way you judge others. Here's the or. You will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. There's the or. Don't judge. You ever, you ever, you, you ever tell anybody, I wouldn't do that. Don't do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Right? There's a warning. Don't touch my stuff. You have a sibling? You better not. Jesus is saying, don't judge or you'll be judged. And not just judged. How you judge others is how you'll be judged. Now this one's tricky. Because when we judge other people, we sometimes look at something specific and say, you should not be doing that. Or that's not the type of person you should be. Or that's wrong in your life. And that might be true in your mind. Because that might not be something you struggle with or that might not be exactly who you are or what, you know. But I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's not saying don't judge somebody about that because if you judge about that, I'm going to judge you the same way about that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying don't judge or the way that you judge others is how you're going to be judged yourself. Now, this passage is interesting because when we think about judgment, there's all sorts of different um, interpretations of what judgment day might look like. And people are always fascinated with the book of Revelation, not just because of, of the mystery of the words in Revelation, but at the heart of it, Christians will kind of want to know what's judgment day going to look like. And there's all sorts of different theology out there that maybe we're all going to come before the throne and there's going to be a scroll of everything we did and that makes everybody panic in the room because we all know what we've done or might do there's other theology that maybe the scroll won't be open because of what Jesus did for us and so when we read these words in this passage here you know I think it would be easy to say okay I'm not going to worry about that judgment because that's going to come later and I'm going to Maybe trust that, that Jesus is going to show up on that day and bail me out. But I'm not so sure that that's what Jesus is talking about here either. I want, uh, think about this one. Think about, think about this. Think about the scandals in Christianity that we witness in our world. Isn't it fascinating that some of the loudest voices in Christianity, some of the most obnoxious people in Christianity, often have whatever they're judging people about come boomeranging back at them. Isn't it interesting that the people, some people who rail against sexual immorality, somehow get exposed by having their own sexual immorality in their life? Isn't it, isn't it interesting that, that the people who rail about money and giving to the church sometimes are the people who are embezzling money from the church and they get caught. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it fascinating that some people who have the most strong opinions on marriage sometimes are outed as unfaithful or abusive in their marriage? Judgment has a funny way of boomeranging right back to us. And maybe it's Jesus is talking about end times kind of judgment, but I don't know. All he's saying is here, be careful. Because if you judge, judgment has a funny way of boomeranging back to you. And we don't get to choose when that happens. Now he's going to move into where our judgment should be pointed. Verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no, no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite? First take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. 
In other words, meaning, my judgment that I hurl at other people is pointed in the wrong direction. In other words, as a follower of Jesus, I need to acknowledge that I am in desperate need of grace. As a follower of Jesus, I need to acknowledge that I am in desperate need of grace. Notice, too, that Jesus recognizes the speck in somebody's eye. You see that in the text? Jesus is not saying it's not there. Jesus is saying, I I don't know what you're talking about. Jesus is saying, yeah, there's a speck in that person's eye. We're going to get into what that means here in a second. But I'm going to deal with that. But have you noticed what you have in your own eye? This one blows me away. When I judge people, and I do, we all do. I've always had this image in my life, in my mind, that that I'm standing there with Jesus. Think about the guy in the street. Like, Jesus is right here, and I'm like, man, isn't that guy messed up? (laughs) He's like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I mean, he shouldn't be acting like that. And Jesus is like, yeah, I'm with you. I I mean, this is the kind of person that gives... People are bad name, Jesus. He's like, I never thought about that, but you're right, you know? <laughs> That's kind of how I imagine judgment, right? Like it's me and Jesus and that person over there, and we're talking about it, and Jesus is like agreeing with me. He's like, yeah, somebody should do something about that. I'm like, I know. And Jesus says, I see what's going on over there, but have you noticed what's going on in your eye? A plank is no different back then than it is today. A plank uh, is like a two by four. I mean, think about, think about the, the hilarity. If I were walking around, this was sticking out of my eye, right? And I say, Jim, hey man, I don't know if you know, but you got something in your eye, <laughs> Right? Megan, I mean, you, do you know that you have something in your eye? Like the people online, can you see this? I don't know if you guys can see this, but like, I don't know where you're at, but I, there's something in your eye. You should do something about that. That's, this is kind of what Jesus is talking about. This is the analogy that he's using. I love the analogy. It's kind of an absurd analogy that, that we would look at somebody and say, Look at what you have going on in your life. All the while, there's, there's like something wrong going on in my life. Hey, I'm going to point something out in your life, yet I've got something going on in my life. Maybe it's something nobody knows about. Maybe it's something way in my past. Maybe it's something just a few people know about. I don't Whatever it is. That's what Jesus is saying in this passage. Why, why are you looking at the sawdust in somebody's eye when you've got a two-by-four sticking out of your eye? I mean, how can you say, take that out of your eye when you've got a two-by-four, you're walking, you're going to knock people over. You, gotta, you, you, you hypocrite. You ever get a speck of something in your eye? A little... A little piece of dust I was, I've got the longest eyelashes like, the, like Venus fly traps they do nothing for men but I mean they're just like they're like these huge Venus fly traps and I got terrible allergies and they like grab every particle going around the atmosphere and they and you, know, you ever get that in your own you get, get something in your eye It's like you start to freak out. You know, you can't even see straight. Sometimes you have to sit down and then you're like, help me out. Do you see something in there? And the person always says, I don't see anything. What are you talking about? You don't see anything. Like I can hardly walk. I'm like crippled here because I can't see. There's just gotta be like a splinter in there. It's like the tiniest little thing. You know when your vision is impaired, right? Jesus is saying, assume first, your own vision is impaired. Assume first, 
you might not know why that person is like they are. Assume first you, you don't know why they're behaving like they do. Assume first you don't know their life experience. Assume first you don't know how they got their speck in the eye. But when we recognize that I've got a two by four in my eye, that speck is nothing. Why? Because it affects me. Do you understand what Jesus is saying here? He's concerned with what we have in our eye as, an, as a metaphor. But he's saying when it comes to judgment, make sure you do some self-reflection before you decide someone's good or bad. Make sure you do some self-reflection before you convict somebody as innocent or guilty. Make sure you do some self-reflection and careful, careful about your spirit of judgment because the spirit of judgmentalism can easily turn into a spirit of condemnation. If you guys have enjoyed the Sermon on the Mount series, I would encourage you, maybe as a next study, to do the book of James. The book of James. James is the brother of Jesus, and his book Three quarters of the book of James is his reflection on the Sermon on the Mount. James kind of dissects Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in order, and he's working his way through. Anybody do the study of James with me here? You guys remember that? The book of James? What's the theme? You suck. You suck. You, go, you remember, right? That's what James said. You, you read the book of James, and you go, man, I suck. I suck so bad, I need help. That's, a, that's James' point in his sermon in his book. And as he's walking through this specific passage, James writes, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but you, you suck. Who are you to judge your neighbor? James' point is we are not the judge. Our role in community with other disciples or people who are trying to find Jesus is not to judge people, is not certainly to condemn people. Jesus is teaching specifically in the Sermon on the Mount is neither one of those. Buried in this teaching is the good news of the gospel, and that is this, that very few people get judged into life change, most get loved into it. I know some of the questions that might be going through the room is, is, I mean, what if somebody is X, Y, Z? I mean, am I, aren't I allowed to say something? I mean, it doesn't the Bible tell us that we should hold one another accountable? Of course it does. The question is, what's your motive? The question is, what is your approach? Do you care about that person? How are you approaching that person? Is it in love with that person? Have you done some self-reflection? And would you receive the same thing for whatever your two by four is if somebody approached you with that? But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about accountability. Jesus is specifically talking about self-reflection of my own plank. And when I realize I've got a two by four sticking out of my eye, I see people differently. I think about people differently. I approach people differently. And I realize that judgment doesn't change them just like it didn't change me. Many years ago, I turned my back on God I walked away. It was a big, long gap in my life where there was nothing about God in my life. And there's all sorts of opportunities in that window that God could judge me and condemn me and turn his back on me, and he didn't. And it was on a communion Sunday that I, by the grace of God, had stumbled into church having grown up in a community of judgmentalism, 
having grown in a church filled with judgmentalism, that I came forward on a communion Sunday to receive this sacrament that we're going to receive here in a little bit, and the, sh- the scales fell off my eye because I no longer felt the judgment that I thought God was putting on me, but the mercy and the grace and the love and how he receives people. I mean, I want you to think about the, the, the sto- there's so much beauty in the story of Jesus. I mean, the people, the people Jesus encountered had giant two-by-fours in their eye. And he did not approach them with judgment or condemnation. I mean, there was, there was pathetic people that, that Jesus encountered and went out seeking in the story of Jesus. It is littered in the, in the scriptures. It wasn't judgment, it was love that made a woman caught in adultery to turn around and change her life. It was not judgment, but love that brought a, a tax collector who had cheated out all these people in their life. Who got that, it was love that brought him down from that tree. It was not judgment, it was love when Jesus went across the lake and there was a lunatic filled with demons that everybody had given up on that everybody had judged. It was love that brought that guy back to wholeness. It was not judgment, it was love when Jesus was on that cross of a criminal who was dying his last breath, who looked at Jesus and Jesus met him with love when he said, I'm gonna see you in paradise today. And when I realized that same God loves me, came for me, died for me, rose from the dead for me, and does not condemn me. It denies me the right to judge or condemn anyone. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans 8, 1. Therefore, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. See, it's love that changes people. Judgment says you have to change. Love makes me say I want to change. And our commandment in this scripture is to become a community of people who lift others up, not tear one another down. And here's why it's important. We are living in a world full of judgment. Look around. It's in the news. It's everywhere you look in our culture. And the reason this is important is we can't change all Christians, but we can change the perception of we Christians. And it starts with how we treat one another. Jesus has given us an image of what a community of disciples does. A community of people who call him Lord and a community of people who come together. And if we can't do that amongst ourselves... We have no hope of doing that in our world. Let me use an illustration to close. Imagine a Sunday that you showed up to church. I know we don't have an electronic sign out out front, but maybe maybe there's a sign like we put outside at Easter. And and today is the day that we're going to reveal your plank in your eye. Today is two by four day at Cornerstone. And when you come in the, in the building, whatever your two by four is, past, present, or future, it's gonna be exposed in front of everybody here today. I imagine that as you guys pull up or walk here, you saw that sign, you might turn around that day. Might be a few less people in the crowd on that Sunday morning 
Some of you might actually shut off your TVs or, or your screens and say, I'm gonna check back next week, maybe even find a new church. I want you to imagine the feeling of walking in this place, knowing that you have your plank, whatever your plank is, whatever that two by four is, everybody in this room is going to know what it is. The reality is this. There's somebody who knows what your two by four is. Every single one of us. There's somebody who looks at you and knows the two by four that's sticking out of your eye. Maybe the thing you're still struggling with today. Maybe the thing you're trying to hide. Maybe the thing you're no, you hope nobody ever finds out. Maybe something that if somebody knew about you, it would change their entire opinion about you. That's what we do every single week when we come in here. That plank is exposed. And rather than close the door, Jesus says you're invited to come forward. Even if you're still struggling with it, come walk with me. You got a seat at the table. And so today we're going to end it with a time of communion. If you've never participated in this sacrament, it's simply something we do to remember the grace and love of Jesus. It's something that we do to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. That he gave his body and shed his blood so that we are free from judgment. And so in a moment, I'm going to invite you guys to come up to receive this if, you, if you're willing to come forward. Uh, just to walk through some logistics here. If you're sitting to my right or left, you're going to use this aisle right here. If you could circle back around this way for flow. If you're sitting in the sections in front of me here, would you move towards the center and use these two aisles to go out? If you're at home, lead yourself. <laughs> Up here we have... I've been hit with a two by four. That's what this message was today. Um, up here we have elements. We have bread, and we're going to have communion servers come forward. If you want to receive it this way, they're going to hand you a piece of bread, and then you just dip it in the cup, not dunk it. Keep your fingers out. Just dip it lightly in the... If that's not for you, there's some other elements here uh, in a cup. There's a wafer, and there's some juice in there. There's also a gluten-free option up here if that's your dietary need. But in this church, we celebrate what is called an open table. And what that means is you don't have to be a member to be, participate in this sacri sacrament. You don't have to have all your stuff together. You might have a plank in your eye right now. And you're welcome to come and receive this. This is an opportunity for us to do some self-reflection and recognize that everybody sitting in this room right now has a plank in their eye. And that we become a community that lifts each other up, not tears one another down. And that if we do that, we bring the name of Jesus high. And maybe, just maybe, in 27, 2027 or 37 or whenever they do a study again, maybe if enough Christians put this into practice, we might change what the world thinks about Jesus. It was on a night that Jesus was betrayed, that he had one final meal with his closest of friends. At that table, there was somebody with a plank in their eye. It was somebody who would betray him, a follower of his by the name of Judas, and Jesus still gave him a spot at the table. And it was during that meal that Jesus took the bread off the table, lifted it up, broke it, and gave thanks and said, this is my body broken and given for you, specifically for you. Take and eat. Likewise, later in the meal, Jesus picked the cup off the table, lifted it up and gave thanks and said, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, all sins, past, present, future. Take, drink, remember, and believe. And so Lord, we just come to you on this day. Lord, may these elements, although not 
magical, be supernatural. And as we receive these elements, Lord, may they remind us of your goodness and your mercy and your grace. That while we were still sinners, you came. That while we walk around with planks in our eye, you say, come. Lord, let us see our own plank. And may we seek you to deal with the stuff that we're dealing with. And may we, in the process, lift one another up. Lord, I repent. We repent for what we have done with your name and your church in this world. Lord, I pray for those who are non-believers that they might encounter the same kind of grace and love and mercy that you have shown to us. May it be somebody who's walking around Maybe judgment-free. I know it's hard, Lord, but maybe judgment-free. And in in that encounter, may that make somebody say, tell me about your God. I don't know that God. Tell me about your God. And may we lift your name high. Lord, may, may this be a time of reflection of whatever's going on in our lives. May we feel your blessing. May May, Lord, we feel your tangible presence in this place. I know you're here, God. May we feel it. May you be so close that we can touch you. May you open our minds. May you burst open our hearts. We believe you came. We believe you died. We believe you rose. May we live as people who believe you are coming again. In your name we pray, amen.